Okay, so a uh, very good afternoon to you all. Uh, today, my plan is that we shall be studying a very important theory uh, called capital asset pricing model. Uh, we shall discuss it, but my I'm thinking that actually I should do it this way, that I don't teach you the theory. I do the reverse engineering. We first study this theory with the real life data. So we, we do the practice first. And once you're comfortable with the nitty gritty of this theory, uh, what we're doing exactly, then we can, maybe we don't even have to learn theory separately then because then perhaps we will learn it very organically by itself. So that's my plan of the day. And then once we study the capital asset pricing model, I hope you remember that last in our last meeting, we discussed about systematic risk and unsystematic risk. Did we? In the theory, in the slides. And then my agenda of the day is that at some stage, we will also calculate the total risk which a company is facing. And then we are able to split it into systematic risk and unsystematic risk. So when some, for example, when you are an investment consultant and you find some client, some would-be investor, so you are not only telling your client that, hey, for this return, this is the risk, but you also tell that client that, hey, if this is the risk, this much is systematic and this much is unsystematic. So you are able to diagnose the risk into systematic and unsystematic risk. That's what I'm doing today. That's the only thing we shall do today. But it might take some time, but not, not too much of time. Anyways, I hope you can see the spreadsheet all. It's available um, in the in the study material folder. Today, I created a new folder called spreadsheets in the study material folder. And from there, you can see this uh, Excel sheet, okay? Uh, what I did, I made this uh, spreadsheet last semester actually. So I took Finnair, uh, national carrier of Finland. Uh, I took the data, of last 20 years, I think you can see that they are 20 years. Let, let me quickly go through here. So this goes as long as uh, year 2000. So yeah, so it's about 20 years. Uh, by default, there are certain columns which come when you, and I hope you know how to download the data we did last week. Uh, obviously, the the way you download the data, it depends upon your source. So the way I download the data from Helsinki Stock Exchange may be a bit different from the way you download from Yahoo Finance or S&P 500 or CAC or DAX or whichever other stock exchange. But the basic logic would be same. Maybe some operations may differ, uh, but the, the, the core idea would be same. So when I download the data, I get the bid price, I get the ask price. Uh, now it's a good time that I shall also discuss these basic words with you. In finance, bid means buying and ask means selling. The rate at which you buy and the rate at which you sell. Yeah? Okay, forget about finance. If I run a shop where I'm selling markers, yeah, the bid price would be the price at which the bid price would be the price at which I buy this marker from my supplier. Mm -hmm. And the ask price would be the price at which I sell this marker to my customer. Tell me, which one would be higher, bid or ask, if I have to remain a profitable company? The bid price is the price at which I buy the marker from my supplier. And the ask price is the price at which I sell this marker to my customer. So what would, what would be what? 
Great. Ask would be higher. The price which I charge from my customer must be more than the price I pay to my supplier. That difference would be my profit. Profit minus cost. Oh, sorry, price get my price minus cost, revenue minus cost. Here, yeah? sound sense, and that's why you can see here that the ask price uh, for any given date would be higher than the bid price. Yeah, the question is the bid price and ask price from whose perspective? Who who is uh, the entity from whose point of view? I'm talking about the bid and ask price. You, the buyer of stocks? No, definitely not. It's from the exchange point of view, stock exchange point of view. Stock exchange is an organization, right? And then in stock exchange, we have the brokers, yeah? And then under, uh, you know, if you go a step down, uh, brokers followed by agents. And usually people who are trading uh, individual, you know, investors like common people, those who want to be uh, trading in the stock markets. You don't have access to even brokers. You normally trade through the agents. So agent in this example is a representative of the stock exchange. If the agent want to buy from you, Finnair share on 3rd of March, 2020, he would buy 4.694 euros. So who wants to buy? Not you. From the point of view of the organization and who's the organization here? Stock exchange. And stock exchange is represented by the agent. So if the agent wants to buy from you, one share of Finnair, he or she would pay you 4.694 euros. But if the same agent wants to sell the same Finnair share on 3rd of March, 2020, he or she would sell it to you at 4.706 euros. Okay, so when the agent buys, you sell. And when the agent sells, you buy. You get my point? So make sure that if you see the bid and ask from your point of view, the whole picture would be upside down. Don't do that. See the bid and ask from the perspective of the organization involved, in this case, agents. Okay, so the price at which the stock exchange buys from you would be lower and the price at which the stock exchange sells to you would be more. That's a common sense, basically. The business, the basic common sense in the field of business that the selling price has to be more than the buying price. But when you sell, uh, when, the, when the stock exchange buys, then you sell. And when the stock exchange sells, it means then you buy. So be careful who's who. And then we have the opening price. When on 3rd of March, 2020, the market started about nine o'clock in the morning in Helsinki. Uh, the price, the market started at 4.63. And during the whole day, during the entire day, the price went, the highest price was 4.834. And during the whole day, 3rd of March, 2020, the lowest price was 4.6. And when the market closed, on 3rd of March, 2020, the price was 4.688, uh, yeah. And then the average of the whole day was 4.736. Believe me, uh, average price is absolutely meaningless. It doesn't say anything. To me, if out of all these different categories of prices, if I have to take one, I will pick up this one, closing price. This is the most important price. When the market closes, the end price is the price which you should also have a look at. Yeah. So, because I have multiple prices, I can't do, I can't deal with all these prices by myself. So what I'm suggesting you that when you are doing any analysis, 
then the price which you should pick up from the in your excel should be the closing price in some stock exchanges for example when you pick up data from let's say london stock exchange in yahoo finance you also get one more category of prices called adjusted closing price adjusted closing price adjusting closing price and closing price are technically same the only difference is that the adjusted closing price include the impact of dividends you know the dividends the during certain time during the year each company distribute a part of profits to its shareholders so for example let's say um, let's say a company has earned in one quarter you know the the do it quarterly usually let's say that between uh, which quarter we are going to now third quarter this yeah. is third quarter yeah? yeah so let's say that the third quarter profit of finair is uh, is 10 million euros yeah and let's say that there are 1 million shares of uh, finair it means that 10 million profit which the company wants to share with its investors and there are 1 million shares so it means for each share how much is the dividend 10 million divided by 1 million 10 10 euros and let's say you own 5 shares then you will get 50 euros in your bank account of course subject to taxes and all that stuff okay so that is called dividend and you don't give dividend every day <laughs> It only happens two times or three times or sometimes four times a year. It doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen 20 times, believe me. It doesn't happen every month. It happens only four times. Mostly companies give uh, dividends four times a year and sometimes they don't give dividend for many, many, many years even. Depends upon the situation. So the difference between the closing price and the adjusted closing price will only you can witness uh, not more than four days in the whole year. And generally, we have 250 something uh, working days in a year because 365 uh, take away 104 weekends. Uh, that leaves about 260 days. And then we have some uh, summer break, winter break, and all that stuff. So, technically, about 250 working days we have every year in a stock exchange. All right, and then the total volume means how many shares were traded in a day. How many, so they were on 3rd of March, 2020, uh, 843,810 shares were traded on that day. So you can see that how many shares were bought and sold. And if you multiply by the price, it becomes turnover. So volume is the number of shares traded. And turnover is when you multiply volume with the price. Do you get my point? If I say that I run a furniture company and I sell tables and I have sold 50 tables in a day, that would be my volume, yeah? And if I say that each table uh, is, uh, e is costing me uh, 100 euros, the price is 100 euros. So 100 tables multiplied by uh, 100 euros would be 10,000, huh, is it? 100 tables multiplied by 10, 100 tables multiplied by 100 euros yeah. is 10,000. So then my turnover become 10,000. Question is, what are trades? Trades. But that is the number of tables here. So 100 tables, 10,000 euros. So then what is this? Yeah, that, that's, it, could be po it could be possible that for the last five days, I'm selling 100 tables every day. Now, 100 tables can be bought in a different way. There could be 100 customers on a day and each buying one table. It means I have 100 trades. How many trades I have? 100. It could be possible that I have 25 customers 
and on average each by four shares. So then my trade would be 25. It could be possible that I have only one customer and he buys all 100 shares, tables, whatever. Then it could be one trade. When you go to the when you go to some stop, uh, some shop, yeah, you bring your stuff in the trolley. You go to the till point. You have one invoice, don't you? One bill. It's one trade. But let, let's imagine that you were thinking about buying ten things. You bought five things and you forgot next five. Yeah. So you bought five. You went out of shop and then say, hey, I didn't buy this, 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 and you come again. What happened? You have one more trade, even though you still buy 10 things, but your trades are doubled now. Two transactions. Make sense? Or not? Yeah. Okay. So now the real thing begins. Well, that was also real. Um, as I said last week as well, that if you want to make a judgment whether a certain stock has performed better or worse. Don't make the decision based on the price. Always make the decision based on the return. I hope you remember, right? So what we do here, we calculate the return, the daily return. And what is this? This is G2 minus G3 divide by G, who's G thing? Yeah, this closing price. So what we do here, we take the current price, always start with the bracket. If you forget bracket, believe me, one thing is certain that your calculation would be wrong. So never forget to put brackets. So bracket starts G2, the current price, minus G3, the previous price. Remember a word of caution, in some stock exchanges, you get the price data from the oldest to the oldest to the latest. Are you with me? In Finnair, uh, sorry, in Helsinki Stock Exchange, you get the data from the latest to the oldest. This formula is okay. But if you remember, hey, Shab told us that it's always G2 minus G3. Uh, so two comes first, three comes later, and you look data from Yahoo Finance. There, I have a doubt, they write the data from oldest to the latest. You will make a mistake. So always take, in that case, it would be G3 minus G2 divided by G3. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that the current price in the bracket, current minus previous divided by previous. Once you get this one, uh, then you need to go in this corner and you see this plus sign, this little, and just click it, and then it will go all the way down by itself. Or you just drag it down, so it works. All good? And then what I did, I did the same thing for the market index. And I, for Finnair, I took uh, OMXH25 index value. And you know what it is this we discussed last week. So again, we have the same dates, 20 years. We have the index high price. We have the index low price during the day. Uh, and then I took the closing price of the index, which is this, right? And then once again, like you choose the return, not the, not the value, same way, you have the closing price, uh, we took the value, uh, sorry, the re return like this. So that's again, uh, like you find the stock return, uh, you also find the index return. And once again, the formula is same. Uh, the current value, bracket starts, the current value minus the previous value, bracket closes, divide by the previous value. And once again, when you calculate one value, Go here, see this plus sign, click it, goes all the way down. Simple. So now uh, you have achieved first milestone that you have modified 
the stock and index values to return. Job one, phase one is over. Yeah, and then I go back to the to the fin return, and then I do what? I find the average return. Average, and as you can see, the formula is so obvious. I find the average of return because I want to find one value. Look, I have 20 years. I want to find one average value of Finnair return in, in the entire 20 years. And I find out that the average return is, average daily return is 0.0247%. How much? 0.0247%. On every day, on an average, Finnair stock is growing every day, 0.0247%, sorry, which is fine. I have no problem with the average daily return thing, but I have one problem with this. We know that as a tradition, as a norm, we want to find the percentage each year. So we want to find the increase or decrease on annual basis, even though, even though the data is daily basis, but you want to show the annual increase, it's more like a ritual, more like a norm we follow. So, but that's not a problem. So what I do here, average daily return, and I convert it to average annual return. And how we do it? Very simple. This is the formula. Is equal to, one plus M2, and what is M2 by the way? M2 is the average daily return, right? To the power of, to the power of what? 252. Yeah, because I, I make a simplified assumption in my head that hey, there are 52 weeks, uh, there are uh, 52 weeks in a year, yeah? But normally uh, after making all these, uh, you know, deduction, perhaps there are 36 working weeks. And 36 working weeks means 252 days, okay? Even though some books I know, they, they, they use 365, but I don't agree with 365 because you don't trade every day. Do you trade on Sunday? I don't think so. So we only focus on the working days, not the calendar year days. So I prefer 252. To the power of 252 minus one because it's a formula, you know? The, and what, what we get then? It means that on an average, on an average, an investor has become richer by 6.414% on annual basis for 20 years. So it means every year the investor is gaining 6.414% for one year, 6.414 for two years, three years, four years, up to how many years? 20 years. Why 20 years? Because we took the data of 20 years. That's why. It's like saying that you deposit, uh, you deposit 100 euros in, in, the, in the bank uh, Nordea, and they give you 5% rate of interest and you keep your money for 10 years with, in the deposit. So you get five euros first year, five euros second year, five euros third year, same thing you do. So you, you do annual uh, interest you get for next 10 years. So the same thing here, an average investor is getting richer by 6.41% each year for 20 years. And the same way, same way, we do it for the index. So if you invest in the market, not, in, not, not only in Finnair, but if you invest in the market index, then how much you earn? Well, then you get the average of uh, your return. So this would be the average daily index return, which is 0.0324%. But once again, as I said, that we used to, we, we are so accustomed of 
uh, seeing the percentage on annual basis. So you modify it to yearly basis. So one plus uh, T2, which is the average daily return to the power of 252 minus one. Why we do minus one? Because we here made a plus one. So to make a balance, we do minus one. So when it comes to uh, the index return on annual basis, it, it appears that if an investor has invested in the whole index, in, in the whole market, uh, then you are getting richer by 8.5% uh, on yearly basis for the next 20 years. Sound sense? So this is what we do in the first phase, in the second phase. In the third phase, we do something which is really, really, really cool thing. In finance, any discussion of return is incomplete without the discussion of risk. And what we do, we, we start discussion about the risk and the risk is here. Look, look at the word average daily total risk. How much full package of risk an investor is experiencing on daily basis. I look at the formula. Have you heard this? This S T D E V. Have you have you have you ever come across this expression before? Have you? You studied statistics, did you? We have a concept of standard deviation. Standard deviation, right? Have you studied? Standard deviation is a concept which highlights how consistent the data is. If the data is very consistent and stable, then you are trusting the data more. The reliability is more, hence the risk is less. On the other hand, if your data is fluctuating massively, then what happens? Then the data is less consistent, less reliable. Hence, if you, if you want to trust this data, you are taking a big risk. I always give this example of football clubs, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Just imagine the two football clubs. And let's say we have AC Milan. AC Milan is scoring three goals in the last five matches. In each match, they score five goals. How many goals they score? Huh? How many goals do they score? Okay, let me do with the Excel. Then, then I think it's better. Because I, I think that it will be much better if I do it with Excel because then you will see something else also. I'm going a little bit off track. Maybe I can do in the, yeah. Uh, my online friends, can you see the spreadsheet, the new one? Can you see the empty spreadsheet? Can somebody confirm? No. 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 Okay, let me do it now. Now you see it? Yes. yes. Let's say we have three football clubs. And let's start with AC Milan. And then we have Manchester United. And which football club you dislike a lot? Huh? Sorry? Which one? I never heard about this football. Is it, <laughs> is it in Colombia? Where, where is it based? Peru? Huh? Which football club do you hate? Huh? No, not these two. Some third one. You know what? Uh, I will not say it loud, but when I was a football fan. Yeah, okay. You get my point? And let's say that each of these teams uh, score, uh, uh, you know, play, let's say, five matches. I, I keep it simple, right? So 
three, 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 three. Not 122, three goals. Sorry, I'm just cooking up the number, so that's why. If I see the if I see the average goal scored by each team, oh, sorry. If I see the average goal scored by each team, It looks that they are equally well performing teams, right? This is so annoying. So many links. But please tell me one thing which team you trust most and which team you trust the least? Which team you trust most and which team you trust least, even though their average goal scoring is equal. On an average, each team is scoring three goals, but which team you try, if you have to make a guess for the next match, in which team's case, you think that you are more comfortable, uh, you feel more reliable uh, to make a guess for the next match? Fernanda, the first one. And the, the least one? The last one, because look at the fluctuation. Sometimes they are horrible, but sometimes they are really good. Nine goals they're scoring in one match, but altogether 15 goals, so three average. So they can be very bad and very good at some. So the trust is less. It happens in a normal life also. You meet some people, are friends, and they are very stable, very consistent in their behavior. So you know that next time you meet him or her, the behavior would be very consistent. But some people are very temperamental. Yeah, so you never know how they will treat you when you meet them next time. But we have it. We have a technique to find, uh, and let's call it standard deviation. It's called standard deviation. Yeah. And how we do it, how we measure it, very simple, very simple. Life is so easy, life is so easy. In finance, life is so easy. So just type in uh, standard deviation, you'll find out somewhere. Here we go, standard deviation. And you pick up the data. Look at that, there's absolutely zero risk there's absolutely zero risk when it comes to Manchester United in terms of the consistency and the reliability of data. Sorry, AC Milan, my, my apologies, AC Milan. And for Manchester United, the risk is more. But look, the highest risk in making some, any guess you want to make about Chelsea, uh, you will go through very high level of risk. So even though the company's performance is same, but the company risk is huge and least. The same argument, but do you understand why I'm showing you the spreadsheet? Do you understand it? That there can be 
two stocks whose performance is same, but they vary in terms of their riskiness, then who do we prefer? If you have two stocks whose annualized stock return is same, then which one you prefer? Hmm? Sorry? No, no, no. I'm, okay, fine. But let's say that if these are not clubs, but these are companies, let's say it's Marks and Spencer. And let's say this is Apple. And this is some uh, funny airlines, Air Mauritius. And they are giving you 3% return every year. Then how would you make a judgment to invest or not to invest? The one with the least risk. If the level of performance is same, the return is same, then you make a decision based on, uh, on your, uh, how to say, riskiness. And yeah. So coming back to the previous spreadsheet, And now I share the same way. I calculate the average daily total risk. And then we, as I said, that we prefer the annualized percentages. So what I do here, I apply the formula to annualize the risk. And we have a formula that take the daily risk and multiply with the square root of 252 because 252 are the trading days, yeah? And that would make you, uh, that would give you the annualized uh, risk. Um, and then we find that, hey, it means that if an investor is getting 6% uh, return each year, but at the same time, the level of risk is 33%, okay? So same way we calculate the risk for the index and we find the daily risk of uh, uh, Helsinki Stock Exchange Index. And then we do the annualization. So technically we are doing the same thing, you know, so. And then you know that how to calculate the beta that we did last week, yeah, did we? The beta shows the impact of the market uh, fluctuations on the company's stock return. It comes to be 0 0.24. And here I wrote down that when the market index values goes up by 1%, uh, the Finair stock return goes up by 0.24%. And if market is down by 1%, then the Finair stock goes down by 0.24%. So it's, but may I ask you one thing? Apparently, Finair is an investment falling in the category of risk lover slash or risk neutral or risk averse investors? Who you think would prefer Finair? If beta is 0 0.24, which type of investors would like to have Finair? When you look at the beta, 0 0.24, uh, who would be a natural, uh, yeah. So, Why so? Uh, because the number is less than one. Mm -hmm. But what if the number is 0 0.9? Risk neutral, yeah. So we have the broad categories that if the beta is more than one, 
like like on other day when last week when we did uh, which company was that last week nokia it was 1.23 1.23 means 0.3 more than the overall market if as a rule the beta is more than 1 then only those investors invest who in that company who are very much um, you know, very brave <laughs> investor, risk lower investors. And if your beta is between 0 0.8 and 1, um, then we say that normally the risk neutral people, they go for it. But if your beta is below 0 0.8, then it's mainly meant for the risk averse investors. And in this case, beta is 0 0.24. 0 0.24, come on, 0.24, very low sensitivity, very low sensitivity, right? So this is what beta technically tells it. Beta is a slope. And I hope you remember that last week uh, I drew a shape. Well, now because I know the uh, beta of Nokia and I know the beta of, we calculated the beta of Finair, so if I stop sharing it and I draw on whiteboard, and if on the y-axis, I take OMX index and OMX index return, sorry, yeah. And on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, I take uh, Finair, it's difficult to write like this, and also Nokia, and Nokia return. What is this? Then I can say that this would be beta of Finair 0.24, And I would say this would be beta of Nokia, which is 1.23. Larger the slope, more is the beta, and that reflects the massive amount of risk exposure. So Nokia has a tremendous amount of risk exposure from the total altogether risk. Whereas for Finair, uh, it's five times lesser, but you see the slope. So generally the slope is less, beta is less. Slope is more, beta is more. Yep, all good. So we go back to our spreadsheet. Uh, we are, okay. Now we have uh, beta. And now we have the, we have uh, Finair stock return 6.414. We have the OMX uh, index, which is 0 0.8502. We have the Finair risk, we have the market risk. And here I calculate coefficient return to risk ratio, which means I divide each company's return by its total risk. And it comes to be 0 0.19 and this comes to be 0 0.39. So you can say that, you can say that, for, for the same amount of risk, for the same amount of risk, the adjusted return of Finair is 0 0.19 and the adjusted return of market is 0 0.39. Do you see the point? Why? Because if you see that these two companies have different return and different risk,
So it's difficult to make some conclusion that who overperformed who. Then we try to calculate the risk adjusted return, which means we discount for risk and we divide it by this. So it means that for 1% risk, for 1% risk, an investor is getting 0.19 percentage of return. For the 1% of risk, an investor is getting 0.39% return from the market. So even though apparently Finair has done great job, 6.414% uh, is not a bad performance, but when you see it in isolation, when you see 6.414 in isolation, it looks very impressive return each year. And remember, it's not one year, it's for 20 years. But when you see the relative performance, comparative performance, then it looks that Finair has performed nearly half of what the market could give you. Are you with me? Absolutely, Finair has done marvelous job. Relatively, relatively, comparatively, Finair has performed half of the average markets in Finland. So that is why uh, it's very important to make a decision that are you making a decision based on the absolute performance or are you making a comparative analysis? So now we make a comparative analysis and we find that actually Finair was a disappointment in comparison to the whole market. Make sense? And then we know beta, our stage three is over, rather stage four is over. Stage one was that uh, we calculate the return, stage two is that we calculate the risk and stage three was that we are making risk adjusted return and making some conclusion, yeah? Now we come to the next stage. And your investor asks that, hey, you know what? I want to know. I want to know something more from you. I know that the Finnair's risk has been more than the risk which come from the market index. But is it possible for you to split, split, break down how much risk to the Finnair investor is coming from the market. Market means uh, macroeconomic changes in Finland or abroad in EU, some issues in EU or anything about the domestic policy of Finland, about the EU policies or general market environment and how much risk is coming from the Finnair itself. They make some bad decisions bad choices of uh, routes, some, some governance problems, some leadership issues, some local internal problems. Maybe they are not uh, improving their R&D. So how much risk is coming from within the company? Can you split it up? And then you say, hey, don't worry, we have a solution to find it out. And the solution is that, then you recall that, hey, in our financial management lesson, we studied systematic risk and unsystematic risk. The total risk is equal to total systematic risk and total unsystematic risk. And you have total risk, by the way, don't forget, you have total risk here, 33.326. All right, then what you do? You multiply what? You multiply beta with V13. And who is V13, by the way? V13 is the standard deviation of the market. So who is V13? Let's see. V13 is, uh, sorry, V3 or 13? Yeah, V13. V13 is the standard deviation. Remember 21.497? This was the standard deviation of the OMX index. So basically you multiply Finnair beta 
So thin air, beta of thin air, you multiply with the standard deviation of uh, OMX Helsinki. And when you multiply, because why I'm using this sign? Because this sign uh, is called sigma. It's a Greek letter. And the Greek letter sigma is used for to symbolize standard deviation. Remember, we have two sigmas. Uh, one sigma is this. And this sigma we use in statistics for what? Anybody has idea? Sorry? When you sum up, when you add something, 2 plus 3 plus 4, then your total is represented by sigma, capital letter sigma. But if you want to show the fluctuation, means standard deviation, then you use small sigma letter, which is like this. Okay. So 5.104% 5 5 of risk out of 33% risk, which thin air is exposed to, 5% risk is basically coming from the market fluctuations. It means what? Leftover, leftover risk is risk coming from, emerging from, arising from, thin air as such. Market has no role to play. It's coming within Finland, uh, within thin air. So what are you able to do? You are able to split up, diffuse, decompose, split up total risk into total systematic risk and total unsystematic risk. Yeah, make sense? Very quick point. Last week, when we were discussing systematic and unsystematic risk, I remember I gave you some synonyms of uh, systematic and unsystematic risk. Did I give you? That, that systematic risk is also called market risk, macroeconomic risk, and unsystematic risk is called firm risk, micro risk, unique risk. And then I use a phrase, residual risk, residual. But I said that, hey, I will not explain why it's called residual risk. Now I tell you why it's called residual risk. Residual means leftover. It means what? First you calculate total risk, yeah? Then you calculate systematic risk and that whatever is left over, because see this, this formula is not a real formula. <laughs> it's a difference of two formulas. So first you calculate total risk, then you calculate the total systematic risk, and then you subtract whatever is left over residual is unsystematic risk. This is, this is why the unsystematic risk is called residual risk, leftover risk, not risk. I would, you, you can never calculate uh, unsystematic risk first unless you have total risk and systematic risk. Sounds okay or not? There is a question from Zoom from yeah. Yanni. Okay. asks whether it's appropriate to compare return to risk ratio of Finnair with other exchanges other than OMX 25. Well, you can, because now you are making a relative comparison. So you can even find, for example, let's say, Yane, uh, uh, 0 0.1925 uh, is the index return in Finnair, uh, uh, in Finland, let's say. And 0 0.3955 is of uh, DAX, then you can say that in Germany, in Germany yeah, no. the same amount of risk your is double. Hence, the German stock exchange are giving you more return than the Finnish stock exchange. So yes, when you have the return to risk ratio, you feel yourself comfortable to compare uh, the performance of different stock exchanges as well. Else? There's some more message, I think, chat five. No, no, I see only two messages. Really? 
All right, okay. Are you fine up to now? Okay, we'll take a quick short break, uh, not for 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes max, come back. And then I want to, I want to help you that how you can calculate CAPM model by yourself. Now, what you know, I hope you know, now you know that what is beta, you can find by yourself. Now I know that you can calculate the daily risk, annualized risk, daily return and annualized return. And you can also go a step forward and you can split up total risk into systematic and unsystematic risk. And by the way, this template spreadsheet, which I'm showing you now is with you in Moodle as well. And now when we come back after a short break, max 10 minutes, uh, then we shall study CAPM. And after that, uh, I will stop. And then remaining time, you guys take some data and try to do these calculations in front of me, uh, Tatiana and Stefan, okay? And we will help you. So short break for 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, now we uh, resume our discussion. But before we uh, resume our discussion, I want, to, I want you to focus on one thing because that would really help you to understand the capital asset pricing model. Keep in mind, and don't forget that Finair's total annualized return was 6.414 percentage a year. So don't forget this thing, okay? Because I would draw your attention back to this thing soon. Sometime, as I said before, that when you look 6.414 percent, it considering the market dynamics that we go through today in today's world, it doesn't seem to be a bad performance at all. But unless you compare it with something, you can't really make a good conclusion. But you can say, you can counter argue that Shab, we have, we have done comparison already, haven't we? We have compared Finair with the market. And when we compare Finair with the market, we conclude that when we calculate these two ratios, we conclude that for the same risk, Finair has produced half of the return in comparison to the rest of the market in Finland, isn't it? But then I would counter argue you, counter counter argue you that no, we have still one more comparison left. And that comparison is comparison of you with you, with yourself. Have you ever compared yourself with yourself? I want to give you an example of comparing yourself with yourself. We organize, an, we organize a finance exam in the class. And there is a student who got three grades out of five. And when I say that, hey, the average class grade are three, or let's say 2.5, <laughs> I wish it doesn't happen. A student has secured three grades and the average class grade is 2.5. Did this student perform better? Is it a good performance or a bad performance? Hmm? A student get three grades. The average grade of the whole class is 2.5. Is it good or bad? Good. But the student is very upset very upset because he or she was expecting five. So even though the student has beaten the market, market mean the student has beaten the, the class index 
the class index is 2.5. The student has scored three, but the student is upset because he or she was expecting from him or herself a fiver. And what the student get is three. So according to his or her own eyes, student has underperformed by two grades. You understand my theory? The same thing we do here. 6.414 percentage of return for a year, for 20 years, thin air. When we compare with the market, well, it's not a good performance. But honestly speaking, how much was even expected from Finnair? Can you relate with the student's example? Now we are going to calculate how much was expected from Finnair. And has Finnair's actual return 6.414 uh, more than that expectation or lower than that expectation? So we are going to, earlier we were comparing Finnair with the market. Now we are comparing, going to compare the actual performance of Finnair with the expected performance of Finnair. And the way you calculate uh, the expected performance is calculated by a very strategic theory used in finance called capital asset pricing model. For the sake of uh, brevity as an abbreviation, we call it CAPM, C-A-P-M. And what is CAPM? You can see from spreadsheet, but if I can quickly write down, uh, Shiny, you will see it. Don't, don't you worry, okay? You can see from the spreadsheet. CAPM says that the minimum if an investor has to invest in Finnair, then the minimum expectation which he or she would have from Finnair would be risk-free rate. And I hope you know what is risk-free rate. Risk-free rate is 10-year bond rate. Which bond? Bonds issued by corporate bonds or the treasury bonds? The bond which is issued by the state treasury. And I took, you can see here, uh, Finland 10-year bond rate. And you can see even the source where I took this data from. Uh, this is minus 0.30%. So as you know that in, in, in the modern world where the interest rates are so low, uh, most of the banks are giving you negative rate of interest. So the risk-free rate usually is derived from the country's central bank 10-year bond rate. So the risk-free rate is the first thing plus beta. And don't tell me that you don't know what is beta now. Yeah, beta times return on market index. And how much return you have on the market index, by the way? 8.502%, uh, this one, yeah? And minus again, risk-free rate. This is a very important theory, CAPM, Capital Asset Pricing Model, Harry Markovich. Uh, he gave this model and then Jensen Trainer and many other people develop it. And there's a full theory in the slides. And next week, uh, I'll come back to this again. Uh, but I, then I would explain more about the theory of it. But this information is available in the lecture slides. But I'm doing it just upside down today. So, and then this is the cap. This would give us the minimum expectation from Finnair. And now, as you see, and by the way, I have given you the resources of information that this, for example, uh, Finland 10-year bond, I took it from this source and then the expected return, well, then we use the CAPM. And when we put all these numbers together, you can see here, does it look like CAPM? Does the formula look like this, this model? U21, uh, U21 is the... Uh, risk-free rate uh, plus U16, 
is beta multiply bracket starts v12 is the return on the helsinki stock index uh, minus u21 is again uh, risk free rate yeah make sense and when you put all these numbers together it comes to be 1.790 it means the average expectation of investor uh, from Fenair was actually 1.79%. But when you see the actual performance, um, even though Fenair has disappointed vis-a-vis -vis market, even though Fenair has disappointed vis-a-vis -vis market, but Fenair actual performance is far exceeding its expected performance. Yeah. So I can say that Finland, uh, Finnair has overperformed. Its actual performance is 4.624% more than what was expected from it. And this, the difference between the actual performance and the expected performance is called Jensen's Alpha. So you also learned very important theoretical concept that Jensen, you know, the very famous uh, financial uh, economist, he, he gave this formulation, Jensen's Alpha. And Jensen's Alpha is 4.624. If it is positive, it means actual performance is more than expectation from it. And if it is negative, it means actual performance is below the expectation. So even though in comparison to market, uh, Finnair is a disappointment, but in comparison to itself, Finnair has done a very good job. Okay, so this is called Jensen's Alpha. So now basically we have done this exercise. So we had a company, we are having a company, we took its data, we took the index data, and then we performed some basic functions of return, risk, comparisons. And in the process, we learned very important uh, theories. We learned how to calculate return, risk, beta, split up risk into systematic and unsystematic risk, uh, compare the relative performance of the company stock with the market. And then very importantly, we compared Finnair with Finnair, the actual performance of Finnair, we compared with the potential performance of Finnair, expected performance of Finnair. Mm -hmm. And we found out that according to Jensen's alpha theory, the actual performance is way more than the expected performance. So even though Finnair disappoints you in one case, but it satisfies you in the other comparison. Okay, so this is, uh, now I think you are in a, position that you can, you know, some basics of the theories, uh, but most importantly, you can apply those theories in the real case company. So with this, I complete this topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you guys have any questions, please ask me. And if you don't have anything, uh, then you pick up some random company from some random stock exchange and try to do uh, try to complete your all these calculations that I have done today and last week. Okay, so I can now pause the recording and uh, but we'll continue our discussion.